गुरबे गौरचंद्राय राधिकाय तदाल कृष्णाय कृष्ण भक्ताय थाद भक्ताय नमो नम जय श्री सचिनंदन गौर हरि की जय श्री गौर नित्यानंद की जय श्री हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जय गौर भक्त वृंद की जय सजीव गोस्वामी थिरुबा महोत्सव तिथि की जय गौर प्रमानंद हरि हरि बोल सो अगेन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी हियर टुडे टू विक्रम प्रभु एंड ऑल द फैमिली इंक्लूडिंग द फैमिली आई वाज जस्ट इंट्रोड्यूस इन द अल्टर नाउ द एक्सटेंडेड फैमिली ऑफ शीलास देयर एंड टू ऑल द लोकल कम्युनिटी थैंक यू फॉर योर योर टाइम एज वी वर सेइंग टुडे अर्लियर सम कृष्णा इज नॉट डिफरेंट फ्रॉम टाइम ही सेज इन द गीता एंड टाइम सो इफ समवन गिव्स मी योर टाइम यू आर गिविंग मी कृष्णा because his time personified so thank you for giving me krishna and hopefully whatever i may say is <laughs> in in reciprocation to that you know, trying to serve back as a maharaj so <clears throat> today in the morning we share a few words some of you have been there regarding the disappearance of sri lajiva goswami <clears throat> from chandrapur invited us to reflect upon that topic today and now we were thinking about maybe sharing some ideas from a recent book that i've published called radical personalism which in one sense is my my way to refer to gaudiya vaishnavism mm-hmm. one of many ways we can refer to gaudiya vaishnav to our tradition mm-hmm. our tradition is the tradition of a personalist tradition and the personalism we pursue is radical and and radical is not a bad word no because sometimes we hear radical and seems like you know, marash wants to burn the whole town down or something <laughs> no? but of course you can have radical violence you can have radical something negative but you so you can have radical compassion radical love radical forgiveness radical personalism so radical means something that goes to the very roots as today you were explaining in the morning i think ramachandra pru when you gave some introduction so radical invites us to the root things mm-hmm. and and the roots generally are things that we do not see basically you mm-hmm. see the tree but you don't see the root but the root you know the root is there because if there's no root there is no tree <laughs> probably the root is even bigger than the tree <laughs> but you don't see it no so it's the biggest thing and it's the most invisible thing in in one sense no so so radical personalism invites us again to explore those bigger yet sometimes invisible aspects of our tradition because in many ways we see we may say we are personalists you know we worship a personal god we worship the supreme personality of god get in the words of prabhupada so that's pretty personalistic <laughs> No, he wouldn't say we worship god he wouldn't say we worship the personality of god he will say we worship the supreme personality of god <laughs> godhead so that's very specific very per- hyper hyper personalized mm-hmm. no? <laughs> so the question is okay we are worship a hyper personalized deity how much we are hyper personalized ourselves mm-hmm. hmm? do you follow my point krishna is such a person ultra personalized personality we have to be also correspondingly mm-hmm. personalized mm-hmm. but sometimes even though sometimes we may be very how to say activist in criticizing impersonalism sometimes we can end up being quite impersonal in many ways <laughs> while promoting personalism so also i think that's an important aspect of not only that we need to work in our tradition every tradition needs to work if you say okay god is a person i want to love god okay but that has to that project of loving god as a person also needs to be reflected in how i relate to each other personally lovingly because if not there is a short circuit in there if i say i love krishna the supreme personality of godhead but i treat all of you as objects <laughs> or i relate to all of you in a depersonalized way krishna will say 
I don't know how much you worship me. <laughs> you follow? <laughs> if you say, Krishna, I love you, but then I treat you all of you in not very loving way. <laughs> follow my point, right? And, and with this, I'm not pointing at anyone and not trying to invite anyone to enter a guilt trip. <laughs> it's just about a, a sincere <coughs> reflection and introspection about what we can improve individually. No? We can always improve something. No? It's not about condemning or blaming, but just having some contagious enthusiasm about how can we grow from where I am. I'm already a person. We are all persons. But how much how much more of a person I can become. I'm already an individual. How much more of an individual I can become? How much I can develop my own individuality? As we say today in the morning, Srila Prabhupada will say, I want that my disciples are independently thoughtful people. That requires some refinement <laughs> Not to develop our own criterion, our own personality, our own individuality to offer to Krishna. No? It's not just, I will develop my individuality for myself. No? It's not my own offering. It's not that I offer that to myself. I do a self-puja or something. I want to develop my sense of personhood to, to offer to Krishna something more relishable. Mm -hmm. Because he's hyper-personalized. He's the supreme personality of Godhead. So he wants to see the supreme personality of ourselves coming up. You follow? If you want to relate with someone who is someone in his supreme personality, that person is waiting for you in your supreme personality to meet him in that level, on that, in that depth, in those roots. So that's what, what I like to call radical personalism. It's a challenging proposal. <laughs> but we need challenges. No? If, if there, is, there are no challenges... We don't grow, basically. Of course, it has to be a challenge that we can somehow grow in and not an impossible challenge because that's totally discouraging. So in the context of this radical personalism and in connection to some topics that we share today in the morning, I thought maybe today to talk about in connection to God, in connection to Krishna, Bhagavan, so I am Bhagavan, to, to talk, share a few words which mostly come in a few chapters of my book, especially one that I called um, Divine Ignorance, <laughs> which has to do a little bit with... Uh, well, you will know what it has to do after listening to my lecture, hopefully. Let's see. But in one sense, it has to do with being willing to un-know un God instead of thinking that I already know everything about him. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we may need to deconstruct some ideas so we can continue knowing the person. If I'm too sure that I know who you are, maybe that certainty, we talk about that today, certainty, if I'm too certain about who you are, that certainty may not allow me to know who you are in a deeper way because I'm too sure that you are this. So what to speak if we have that idea with God, no? the unlimited. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I want to, to share a few words today about how our ideas about God, our idea of God does not equal God. I have an idea of who Krishna is, but Krishna is not limited to my idea about him. Follow my point? I don't want to make a play of words. And we have an, each of us, if I ask you who is Krishna for you, you will share something, hopefully. And I'm not saying that your idea is wrong. I'm just saying be careful of limiting Krishna mm. to only that. Follow. You can have a very accurate idea about Krishna as this is described in the scriptures, in parampara. I have nothing against that. <laughs> but we have to be careful of thinking that's all that Krishna is. Krishna cannot be more than my idea about him. Because in that case, we're making Krishna limited to my capacity to conceive of him. Mm -hmm. And when Krishna wants to appear in our lives in another form, in a deeper form, in a deeper way, we may not recognize him because we already have our idea about him. 
if you follow. And Krishna may want to reach us in a more intimate way, how we may even reject that and escape from that. Well, this is the famous example that we find in, that's one of the main lessons of the Brahma Bimohan Lila. Chapter mm, 13, 12 and 13 of the 10th canto in the Bhagavatam. As you know, Brahma, first created being in our tradition, and he meets Krishna in the beginning of creation. Krishna appears as his guru, but he appears in a more formal way, so to say. He doesn't appear in the full informality of Vrindavan. He appears more in front of Brahma like a guru, not like doing Gyan Mudra, like instructing the disciple and sharing some Upanishadic wisdom and telling what to do for the creational functions. But it's speaking more like in a more, um, what's this word? Um, uh, Krishna is remembrance and forgetfulness. <laughs> like more formal, but I want to use, use another word. But it's, anyhow, you get my... You get my, my idea, yeah. Familiar? Sorry? Like you meaning familiar? Like no, the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, you understand. But my, like a more... Um, Reverential? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's in the tip of my tongue. You know. <laughs> it won't come now, as you know. I will continue speaking. I will come half an hour later. <laughs> no? So in that tone, <laughs> Krishna talked to Brahma. And Brahma got that idea of Krishna. Okay, that's Krishna. No? That's Krishna. That's my guru, Krishna. Krishna is Brahma's guru. And that's his God, that's Krishna. So he got his idea, no? Mm. This is Krishna. He put the boundaries, this is Krishna, everything else outside that is not Krishna. <laughs> and, and Brahma interestingly asked Krishna at one point, and Prabhupada confirms that in the purport, one point Krishna shook hands with Brahma. Interestingly. And Brahma felt like, oh, I like this. Because no? generally you are not like shaking hands like, with God, no? Like, <laughs> so Brahma was like, oh. And, and, and the commentators, Prabhupada, Vishwanath, Chakwari Thakur, they say, at that moment, Brahma wanted to have Sakya Rasa with Krishna, mm. like friendship. He wanted, oh, I'd like to be your friend. He didn't say that, like, how to figure this out, but that desire sprouted in him. So then a few years passed of Brahma, which for us means quite a little bit more. <laughs> And eventually, that desire that Brahma had, remember, Brahma had this idea of Krishna, but also this sprout of, I want this friendship. So Krishna said, okay, in time we will work on that. <laughs> and eventually, as you know, we reached the Bhagavatam, 10th Kant, chapter 12 and 13, we have the Brahma Vimohan Lila, which is with Krishna kills Agasur, and it's a whole com commotion about this demon giant serpent being killed just by Krishna walking inside of him and then different demigods come to witness the whole situation and the news start to spread and, and, and it reaches Brahma's ears so he's like wow what's going on there on earth so he goes no? <laughs> and when he goes Agasura was already killed and Krishna and his friends resume the picnic they had started before Agasura was killed they had started the picnic Agasur appears, so okay, some inter interruption was there. Now they're again in picnic. So Brahma goes, and remember, he has this idea of this is Krishna. No? Okay, there was some sh shaking of hands, but mostly was the, the formal thing. No? The guru instructing the disciple in a more serious way. So he has that samskar, that idea. And suddenly he arrives to Vrindavan and Vrindavan is precisely not the land of formality. Mm. <laughs> no, their God is at home. No? He doesn't wear shoes. He's barefoot. No? Vrindavan is God at home. No? Like if you go to visit someone, if it's a formal visit, the person won't receive you barefoot. No? It will be a whole like list of bureaucracy and protocol and good morning, hello. What if the person is God? No. <laughs> like if you go to see the president of New Zealand, whatever, I mean, I don't know if you would like to, but I don't know if this is political, local situation, but <laughs> let's say that you go to visit him. If it's your intimate friend, he may be just in shorts and any T-shirt and like barefoot. But if he doesn't know you, it will be suit and tie and he won't be at his home. It will be in the presidential house and you have to go through... 108 filters 
and you have to know the protocol and how to like they do in Britain with, with the queen or the king, you have to bow down like here. You have to know how to say, what to say, what not to say. That's even more important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all these rules and regulation, endless. So God, by Kuntha, Vishnu, Narayan, that's one thing. That's God at office, working. But in Vrindavan, that's God at home, full informality. So Krishna is having a picnic. Generally, you don't imagine God in a picnic, but here you have it. So Brahma is coming with his idea of Krishna, this, and suddenly he sees Krishna in a circle, sitting on the floor, barefoot, eating with his hand, with his left hand, mm -hmm. breaking all etiquette. <laughs> all his friends are eating with him. And I mean, one layer of another of Brahma's head exploding basically because he says, and Brahma, on top of that, one name of Brahma is Bidhi, as you may know in the Bhagavad and it is say, if you perform all the Varna Ashram duties perfectly, which is basically impossible <laughs> almost, because if there are so many rules, so many things to do, what not to do, where to look, in which direction. 100 lifetimes of doing it without single mistake, you can be born as Brahma. Mm -hmm. So that speaks how much Brahma is acquainted with all this world of protocol. So he's coming to Vrindavan, being that person, <laughs> having this idea of Krishna, and Krishna is shattering that world in pieces. In one sec, he's just sitting and laughing and eating with left hand and tasting from his friends' picnic lunches and putting, and his friends are, are tasting her own thing. I say, wow, this is so good, Krishna, try it. And they put that on Krishna's mouth directly, their own remnants. I mean, you can imagine where is where Brahma ended up at that point. It was too much. So again, he came with his idea no, of God. And then he came to Vrindavan, and his idea of God, actually he, he witnessed a higher idea of God. Remember, at one point Brahma wanted friendship with Krishna. So Krishna is now giving him a trailer. What does it mean to be my friend? <laughs> Let's have a picnic together. So Brahma said, I want to be your friend. But when he saw the implications of being a friend, he was like overwhelmed for a minute. He couldn't understand. He still wanted to be a friend, but he was not able to process the whole experience in, 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 one, in one moment. So as you know, Brahma thought, this cannot be Krishna. He he, this cannot be God. I, I met Krishna. I know who he is. This cannot be. He must be an imposter, and like imitator. So I will kidnap. I, I won't enter into all the details of the story, but Brahma thought, I will kidnap Krishna's friends, Krishna's cops, and I will show the whole world how this guy is an imposter and is not my actual guru, God, Krishna. Mm -hmm. And the rest is story, you know? You know what happened after. <laughs> oh. So the whole Brahma Bimohan Lila came. Bimohan, Mohan means bewildered, and Bimohan means super bewildered mm. no? and Brahma is the most intelligent person in the whole universe no? with four heads thinking in the four directions at this point his four heads were spinning <laughs> like crazy because he was like what's going on here what's going on no? and Krishna is expanding into all these calves and all these boys and each of these forms then show forms of Narayan and all of these forms disappear suddenly and just Krishna remains with the lamp of Sweet rice in his left hand, looking for his cups and boys, where they are, where are they? Like if nothing, like if he's in illusion, what's going on? And Brahma is like, <laughs> and then he falls at, at the feet of Krishna. He, he, he jumps, it is say, Vishnu Chagaritakur said, he jumped from his swan and touches the earth. Generally, the devas are known for never touching the earth. No? Like they, this hierarchy is there, the devas. They don't touch the ground. Brahma not only came and stepped, he put his head on the ground of Raj mm -hmm. <laughs> and started to pray to Krishna. There's a whole beautiful chapter, 14th chapter of the 10th canto, the Brahma Stuti, mm -hmm. where he starts to pray and beg forgiveness. And ultimately, one of the last prayers he says, he mentions there, like, there are some people who say, I know Krishna. Actually, he was one five minutes ago. <laughs> he implies that. Now, there are some people, like he likes a way of saying, 
There are some people, but actually he's talking about himself. You know? <laughs> there are some people who think, I know everything about Krishna. But in my, in my own case, he says, I don't want to say that anymore, basically. No? And if someone says that, I offer pranam to them from a respectful distance. But I don't dare to say, I know everything about mm -hmm. Krishna. I already thought about that a few minutes ago and see the result of that. No? My forehead's spinning like crazy. <laughs> no? so, so I'm sharing this well-known pastime in, in connection to the topic I'm, I'm trying to share. No? Like, that happened to Brahma. He's the original guru of our Sampradaya also. <laughs> <laughs> so he's teaching us a valuable lesson mm -hmm. that we have to we have to be always open to upgrade our idea of who Krishna is not only of who Krishna is of, of what everything is of who each of us is now we, we, we have to be careful of not how to say as we say today in the morning not being addicted to closure but to disclosure no. Even if you, I don't know, some of you may live with, some of you may father, daughter, wife, husband, and you may say, okay, I, I know my husband, I know my wife, and of course, I won't deny that, but also if you conclude fully that you already know everything about that person, that becomes a problem, because we don't even know everything about ourselves, <laughs> about others, what to speak, no? and, and the potential we have. So we always should leave the door open, that's my point, not to n further knowing each other more. And it all begins with Krishna, because God is the root of everything. So if we apply certain way of thinking to God, probably we are extending that to everything else. Mm -hmm. So for me, Krishna is this, and that's a finished case, Probably unconsciously, we may be extending the same pattern to how I relate to everything and everyone else. And that will be a very healthy result that we will harvest, just to say it in kind words. <laughs> so, and, and many times even, because I, I said before, you may have a correct idea of God, but that idea can always become more nuanced, more deep. But at many times, we may not have a correct idea about who Krishna is also. And we may need to correct that. No? Sometimes I, many times I've found people who consider themselves atheists. And generally, of course, they will say, I don't believe in God. But actually, what they do not believe in is a certain idea of God. If you start to talk to them, properly instead of just wanting to convert them or anything <laughs> if you are willing to have a conversation and listen to them like why of course how can you say that god does not exist to begin with that makes not too much sense because you cannot prove someone's non-existence mm -hmm. no i cannot say i can just say so far i haven't met that person but i cannot say that person does not exist so what you are actually saying is Certain ideas about God do not make any sense to me, and I cannot believe in them. And I will say, I cannot believe in them either. No. <laughs> now, sometimes I've met atheists. People say, I, cannot ac I don't believe in God. I cannot accept that God is a grumpy daddy figure on the cloud with a thunderbolt in one hand, another thunderbolt in the other hand, or God has four hands, so he may think of four thunderbolts. That's so... <laughs> and angry and willing to chastise and send you to, <clears throat> I cannot believe in that. And I will say, I completely agree with you. We are on the same page. I cannot agree with that. But still, I'm not an atheist <laughs> because that's not God, basically. Mm -hmm. So, so w an atheist can have a wrong idea about God. And the problem, my, my point with this is that some people may have an idea of God that is unacceptable, and therefore they consider themselves atheists. But some other people consider themselves theists, accepting the same idea of God that for other people is unacceptable. You follow my point? That's interesting. Some people say, I cannot accept a chastising figure who easily gets angry. God does not exist. And other people is, I believe in God, and he is an angry figure who, who very quickly gets, that's my God. So it's interesting, the same idea for some people makes them to become one thing or the other. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And of course, in our tradition, we're quick to say, okay, Maharaj, but we worship Krishna. Krishna is the all-attractive. No? He's God at home, as you were t- saying, and he's sweet and he's intimate. Yes, but sometimes we may still carry unconsciously some ideas about him that had nothing to do with that, with who Krishna actually is. And we create our own version of Krishna. Many times, many times, not all, but sometimes even to, due to some unresolved childhood issues. For example, with parental figures. Now that day I was reading a book that they made the research. It's interesting. It's regulated atheism, but it's interesting to say like 90% of people who consider themselves atheists, and this is a very exhaustive research, those, that 90% have problems with their father figure at childhood. <laughs> so that's a number, 90%. <laughs> so that's something to think about, right? And again, we may say, well, but I'm not an atheist. Yeah, I agree. But if we have some unresolved human issue from the past, that even may get in the way of our theism and of how we conceive God. Like, like, we were, like we were talking, for example, today in the morning. I've met about this, uh, that sometimes, for example, some time ago I, I was talking with, with one devotee and she, she, was, she was suffering a lot. And she told me, Maharaj, um, I'm, I'm very, how to say it? Yeah, I'm in deep anxiety because I'm not able to finish my 16 rounds. <laughs> and I love many, I know many enter into the neur- neur- neurosis uh, chamber because of this. <laughs> and I'm afraid that Krishna will, at the end of my life, send me to a, to a non-human body because of that. And, and I was like, wow. Do you think that Krishna is such an ugly person? <laughs> Because, because she was like, I'm sincerely trying, but I'm having these other engagements. I don't have time. I'm having some, but I want to be a devotee. I want to give myself. And she, and she was crying. I mean, she was not like looking for, for this a blessing from the Swami to. <laughs> no, you follow my point. No, no, no we're not playing the victim. So I can. Okay, no problem. You can continue in Krishna. I, I will talk to Krishna. We'll make the making, we'll make a new contract for you. <laughs> There are always exceptions to the rule. No, <laughs> no, no, no. She was really wanting that, but somehow not being able and suffering like hell for that. Especially this idea, Krishna is angry with me. She, he is not happy with this, and probably I will lose the human form of life. So I was almost in tears myself witnessing that. I said, no, 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 no. That, that's not Krishna. Mm-hmm. No. Well, <laughs> at least that, that's not my Krishna. <laughs> no. and, and we try to develop this idea no? on how we, can, uh, how we can really develop this idea. Okay, that's who Krishna is. And, and engage in practice and engage in life with that idea. No? Thinking he's angry, he doesn't like me, he may take me to a peak body in the next lifetime. <laughs> And it's all fear and it's all anxiety and it's all like, I mean, I don't think you f- you will feel very much attracted to that person in one sense. <laughs> no? so you are more afraid than anything else. And, and, and that's not the type of relationship you want to have with Krishna. Love. Fear is, the, in one sense, the opposite of love. No? So, so, so it's an example. It may sound like an extreme one or maybe not. <laughs> but it's an example of how sometimes we, we can project on Krishna, an idea about him that doesn't correspond with him. And he's not that, but we became convinced that he's that. And we are convinced, and nobody can change our mind. <laughs> but that affects all our practice, all our life, all um, our relationship with him, how we see everything else, by just having the wrong idea about who he is. It sounds simple, but it's delicate. So we have to at least, as I said, remain open to the possibility that I may not have the most accurate idea about Krishna. At least open to that possibility. I'm not saying that's a fact. But especially if that idea that you, whatever you, idea you may have is taking you to fear, 
neurosis, feeling threatened, practicing Krishna, practicing Krishna consciousness from a place of, I don't know, pressure, like intimidation. Like, again, this idea of if, if I do not get to Golok down in this lifetime, I don't know what will happen. No. But again, if you are sincere, and that's your job, no? I mean, it's my job as well to be sincere myself, Krishna will honor that. And, and you shouldn't even think about losing the human form of life. Krishna is saying the Gita in so many places. No? I don't know, he says, Neha Bikramanasasti Pratyabhayana Vidyate Svalpam Apyasya Dharmasya Treyati Mahatubhaya Even the slightest progress in this path of bhakti, I take that into consideration, and that will protect you from the greatest danger. So he makes this contrast. Even the slightest pro progress protects you from the greatest danger. Nami Bhakta Pranashati, as you know, he's telling to Arjuna, declare that my devotee never perishes. Very firmly, he's saying, say that loudly. And so many other lines in scripture where Krishna's making sure I'm taking care of you. And actually, that's the main aspect of Sharanagati for us who want to practice surrender is Krishna is protecting me. Rakshi Shati Tibishwaso Goptri to Ivaranam. To trust that Krishna is protecting me and to accept that he's maintaining me. And to trust that, no? not to feel at any moment he will throw me to hell or who knows what. <laughs> that's, that's not Krishna. He's a person. He's sensitive. He has a heart. <laughs> he appreciates our... Oh, thank you, our sincerity. So, <clears throat> so it's important that we remain willing to to meet him as he is. No, Srila Prabhupada said the Bhagavad Gita as it is. So we meet the Supreme Personality of Godhead as he is. No, not as, as, not as we think he is, but as he is. <laughs> and many times that implies we being willing to let go of certain ideas that may not be the most accurate, like Brahma. Again, Brahma is our guru. He's teaching us. He has a certain idea of Krishna. It was not wrong, but it was not the full picture. Mm -hmm. When he received the full picture, he was overwhelmed. He failed, so to say. But then he immediately acknowledged that, and that so-called failure became a, a new source of realization, and, and eventually he attained his goal, basically. So in the same way, we shouldn't be embarrassed by acknowledging, okay, I, I may not have the most accurate idea of Bhagavan, but I want to. So I'm open for him to reveal himself as he is. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be too sure about him ever. Because again, Krishna is unpredictable. <laughs> the moment you are too sure about who you think he is, be ready for him to make, come and say like, <laughs> because he wants us to remain humble. No? And, and humble also means I'm open for l to learn more. I'm a student forever. I'm, I, I haven't never. I, I, I've never concluded my study on the infinite. <laughs> I mean, we are studying the infinite. How can we say finished? I have my PhD on infinity or something. <laughs> It's not possible. So the Siddha Maharaj will say, we are students forever. Forever means forever. <laughs> because Ananta, one name of Krishna is Ananta. He has no limits, no end. In the Bhagavad, there are many verses, but Krishna himself says, I don't know myself fully because I'm constantly expanding. <laughs> I'm always discovering something new. Imagine, God himself is saying that. <laughs> No, like Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu is Krishna himself wanting to explore more the heart of Sri Radha, but also his own self through the eyes of Sri Radha. So Mahaprabhu is Krishna himself wanting to know him himself more. God himself is eternally dedicated to that exploration. So to say. <laughs> He's humble. He has no problem in admitting that. No, it's not like, oh no, I should, I should present myself as knowing everything. No, 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 no need to do that. Our God is not doing that. So we don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, in our particular tradition, we have this blessing that is 
but also can be a curse if we don't know how to handle it, that we have so much information about God. We have such a detailed description of everything. Sometimes say, say joking. I mean, in which other tradition you come to know which is the name of the uncle bells of Krishna? Mm -hmm. I mean, to begin with, in which other place you get to know that God uses uncle bells? <laughs> What to speak of what's the name of the uncle bells? <laughs> or the earrings of Sri Radha, or the name of the bina she plays, or the name of, of all the varieties, the three main flute varieties that Krishna uses, and all the sub varieties. It's like a world of detail, which is beautiful in itself, but it can create, if we are not handling that with proper humility, this, this problem that we already know everything about Krishna. Because nobody has that level of detail we have, no? And you, they, they will go to the streets and bully other people from other traditions. Do you know what's the name of the flute of God? <laughs> Things like that. We develop a superiority complex, so to say, no? because we know so much. But in one sense, that can be only theory also. That can be only information. We can get our heads filled with, memorize all these names and details, but again, develop this same false sense of certainty. Now I know God. Now I, I grabbed him. I control him. That's it. That's Maya, basically. No? Maya means the tendency to... That which Prabhupada will say many times, Maya means that which can be measured. So when you think you know someone, in one sense, a way of measuring. No? I know you. No? I know you. You are here, here, here. You are this, this, this. So I, I'm measuring you, which means I can control you. The ultimate list, I can control you. I'm the controller. <laughs> so watch out for thinking like that with, with the supreme controller. <laughs> hmm. So it's important that I will say that we remain in that. The humility is so important in our tradition, as you may have heard. But humility also means so many things. Hmm. Humility doesn't mean just like, like a mudra. I mean... I have no problem doing that, it's beautiful, but <laughs> it's not just a physical performance, no, like, okay, I have to be humble, no? hands together, up and down, no, <laughs> no, that's, that's not necessarily humility, so humility also means, again, I remain open to learn, I remain open to rediscover Krishna, I remain open to rediscover my own tradition, I'm not so sure about everything, I don't want to be that certain. It's dangerous. <laughs> I want to leave open place for further input, no more disclosure. As we say today, Krishna is ever evolving. Remember we shared this section that Krishna is becoming every, every time more beautiful. So if Krishna is becoming every time more beautiful, I have to catch up with his increased beauty. <laughs> I cannot say, okay, I, I already know Krishna, but he already became more beautiful. So I, I don't know that new level of beauty. I have to catch up with that. <laughs> He became more Krishna, because Krishna means the old beautiful. The old beautiful becomes more beautiful, means Krishna becomes more Krishna. So I know who Krishna is. That's an outdated version now. He's already something more. <laughs> That's why in the Leela and Brindava, every, everything is going on. Everything is trying to catch up with this increased beauty and harmony. It's not like, okay, let's take a break for two weeks or something, because like, it's, it's exhausting. No, no, nobody's complaining. Everything is growing, moving, expanding, but nobody is complaining. And everyone is open. Now, this is the symptom of love. Rupa Goswami says, Anurag, one of the developments of love, Sneha, Mampranai, Rag, Anurag, Bhav, Mahabhav. Anurag means the symptom of Anurag is when you love someone and you see that person you love, every time you see that person, it feels it's like the first time you're meeting that person. Although you have met that person endless times. But the nature of love is that it's increasing at every moment, so the, 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 the beloved always appears new. <gasps> so maybe Radha and Krishna were together five minutes ago, <laughs> and for some reason they, they separate, and after 30 seconds of that separation, Sri Radha looks back and sees Krishna in the distance, and she will ask Lalita, who is that beautiful, sapphire-like boy? Wow. And she only does say, like, are you joking? You were with, with him five minutes, five seconds ago. No, 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 it's not possible. And who is he? And the same from Krishna. Because again, they are rediscovering themselves at every moment. That's the nature of love. 
at every step, they are like, wow, <laughs> try to imagine. We cannot even imagine. Even if I tell you, try to imagine, our imagination is limited to our previous experiences. So there's no way even to imagine that. <laughs> Just to be charmed and, and feel inspired by the prospect that, wow, such a life exists. Right? But the price to pay for such a life is we have to be humble and open to this constant transformation, this constant change, basically, in one sense. And change is not generally the favorite word for most people. Generally, we don't like change. <laughs> we like things to be as they are in their place. <laughs> what to speak of eternal change at every second? That's like, sounds like hell for some. Although for us, it's heaven. It's constant evolution, constant unfolding. But love is about change. That's the thing. Love is about changing. Even if we, we feel, okay, but I don't love yet. Okay, so in order to love, we need to change so much. And when we love, we'll be changing so much <laughs> because of love. Whether we have love or not have love, change is somehow a constant in life. So we have to make peace with the idea of change because spiritual life is all about change. We don't come to Krishna consciousness to just remain the same way we were before Krishna consciousness and let Krishna consciousness adapt to me. <laughs> let the whole environment change so I don't change. That doesn't sound too generous. No? You might just establish a relationship with someone and say, I'm just expecting that you change everything you need to change so I don't change anything. I love you. <laughs> no, 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 that's not, that's not love. No? Love there implies a willingness to change and, and the risk to change, if you will. If, if I love someone, if I open myself to that loving relationship, the love of the other person will change me. I will become a different person by receiving the love of someone else. Not like some of you are parents and you have a kid. To give an example among many and, and that new entity, Change, you are another person eventually. It tr transforms you. No. You open yourself to, to affection, to love, to that unique interaction. You are no longer the same person before that. Are you willing to let go your previous sense of self to become a new sense of self as we were talking today in the morning? Die to live, die to live. <laughs> no. it's, a constant, it's a constant movement. So... So that's basically the idea, no? and it all begins again with, with God. He's the root of existence. No? Everything emanates from Krishna. Ham sarvasya prabhavo matasarvam pravartate krishna says in the Gita. Everything emanates from me. So however, we, however you treat the root, the whole plant will be affected. Let's put it like that. No? Bhagavatam is saying, you water the root, the whole plant will be nourished. Okay, but if you mistreat the root... <laughs> the whole plan will be ruined. So in, in the way we approach the divine, somehow or other that will color the way we see everything else. No? So I wanted just to make that main point today that our idea of God does not equal God. No? We have an idea of God, it may be wrong and we may, meet, may need to correct it or it may be right and we may need to expand it. <laughs> Because even if you tell me it's totally legal, my idea of Krishna Maharaj, I can quote you all the verses from Shastra, it's legal, I'm legal, <laughs> okay? But it doesn't mean that you cannot expand from that. Mm -hmm. Because again, Krishna is always becoming more. We have no excuse to be lazy, again, <laughs> or conformist. Mm -hmm. Krishna wants something exciting with us. He wants a relationship that is dynamic, that is moving, that is alive. Because if not, we ourselves are, are conceiving God and our relationship with him that in a way that is completely unattractive for us to begin with. <laughs> so as we were saying today in the morning before finishing the class, let's be careful to practice bhakti in a way that we are not happy with. Because the more we practice, the more rejection we develop to that. And we hear, but you are supposed to do that for eternity. So imagine if you're, you start to think, okay, I don't like bhakti and I'm supposed to do bhakti for eternity and I don't like it. 
I won't do something for eternity that I don't like it. I will go somewhere else. No, no, that's not the idea. The idea is practice bhakti in a way that is susukam kartum, as scripture says in the Gita. It has to be executed with joy. Of course, there, are su- there is suffering, there is problems, there is trauma. That's, that's there. But that doesn't do away with the fact that bhakti should be executed with, with joy. Mm-hmm. With, great, with gratitude, with depth, with commitment. So, so my point is, yeah, we are, most of us or all of us are voluntarily by decision chose this path. <laughs> So we want to tread the path of bhakti <clears throat> with choice, with commitment, with, with, with joy. But for that, we have to have the proper idea about who is God, who is Krishna, what is bhakti. Uh, and hopefully practicing in a way that is helping us to heal whatever needs to be healed instead of adding new layers of trauma mm-hmm. in the name of spirituality. Because that can happen. We may come to Krishna consciousness with some trauma, or we can add further layers of that <laughs> by embracing the practice from a dysfunctional place. It's not that Krishna consciousness is traumatizing, but we can embrace that from a wrong place and it can distort so many things. So we don't want that. You know, so <laughs> and one of the main ideas, again, for me is let's have the right idea of who God is. Simple, but it's important. <laughs> like, like I, and with this, I will conclude. Like we were saying the other day uh, in Nelson, we gave a whole class about the unconditional love of Krishna, which is a topic that is not very emphasized in our tradition for whatever reason. I was asked, why is not so emphasized? And it's like, wow, good question. I don't know. I will need to do some research. <laughs> but generally, we don't, we, we don't, at least in my experience, I haven't heard that much often saying, Krishna already loves everyone unconditionally. Generally, that's not so much part of our discourse, but that's in, sh- in the scriptures everywhere. Mm. Uh, when I wrote my recent book, I was writing about that, and I, and I was like, okay, this must be in Shastra somewhere. And it was like, yes, one quote, two quotes, three quotes, six quotes, and it was like, it's everywhere. But how, how I didn't see mm. <laughs> what we are not talking about it. No, Christians say, I'm the friend of everyone. I'm, I'm, I love everyone. Everyone, not only my devotees. No? Because sometimes we love to emphasize Christian loves his devotees because we are devotees. So <laughs> it's nice to think about that. <laughs> oh, I happen to be his devotee. I, I and Christian loves especially his devotees. And I, I happen to be in that elite. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah, he loves his devotees, but he loves everyone else for that matter. Of course, he loves his devotees special because his devotees reciprocate with him. Mm. Some other people may be denying his existence, but he still loves them unconditionally, although they do not reciprocate. The special love of Krishna for the devotees is because the devotees reciprocate. So he adapts to that reciprocation and gives something special back. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love everyone else. It's simple, but it's a very interesting idea because many times we conduct ourselves in practice trying to think, okay, I will do my sadhana, so at some point Krishna loves me. And that's, that's wrong. I'm pressing the wrong button here. Krishna already loves you, and you are doing sadhana so you can love him back. That's it. We, we, we shouldn't try to earn Krishna's love. That's already given. <laughs> That's a different orientation. It's a simple thing, but it creates a very different orientation. If you practice trying to, okay, I hope Krishna likes me someday. No? I'm so worthless, so useless, so unlovable. Hopefully Krishna likes me someday. That's very heavy rock to carry if you practice from that place. Instead of thinking, Krishna already loves me unconditionally. Without my merit, I didn't do anything for that. It's unconditional. And that's so moving, so transforming that I want to do something about it and give something back in return. So I choose to practice to reciprocate with his original unconditional love. For me, that's very different orientation. It changes a lot of things. 
We don't need to earn God's love. That's a ridiculous idea. That's already given. We just want to reciprocate. We, we want to celebrate that fact that Krishna loves us and want to give that back to him. <laughs> so again, this is one point in relation to our main topic today, which is our idea of God. Which is our conception of God. How do we think of Krishna? Because thinking of Krishna is not only thinking, okay, peacock feather, blue color, flute, not only a visualization of all the paraphernalia, but also his unconditional love mm. towards each one of us, which is beautiful, but as I said the other day, is challenging because Krishna loves me unconditionally, so nice. Yes, but he loves everyone else unconditionally also. And you should treat them as such, considering that. Mm. It's like, oops, that's a problem. <laughs> No, because you get easily angry or you judge someone and this guy is like this. He's been loved unconditionally by Krishna also. Mm. You have to reorient your whole approach to everyone. Mm. And that's the idea, of course. That's why Mahaprabhu said Manadina, offer respects to all. At least beginning from the fact that everyone is unconditionally loved by Krishna. Mm. Of course, in a practical sense, if someone wants to kill your family, you will do something. No, it's not like... You are unconditionally loved by Krishna. I honor you and do whatever you want. I'm not saying that. But even on the foundational sense, you have that maybe at some distance from certain people you may need to take. But everyone is unconditionally loved by Krishna. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful, but it's challenging. Because we have to recognize that in everyone else. And we have to recognize that unconditional love means I didn't do anything to deserve it. And it's there. And generally, we are not very interested if something, if I, if, if something is not has not been earned by me. I'm not so interested in recognizing something in which I have no personal merit. <laughs> For the ego, it's not very exciting. <laughs> All the credit goes to the giver of the gift. And it's like, oh, what about me? <laughs> You're just you have been given with that gift unconditionally. All, all credit goes to the unconditional mercy of Krishna. It requires lots of humility to be okay with that. <laughs> and that's the humility we are expected to develop. No? So, Anyhow, a few thoughts in connection to different points in connection to the main topic. of Each of us have an idea of Krishna, and it may be great, correct, accurate, beautiful, but it can always be more correct, more accurate, and more beautiful. So we have always to leave it the door open for him to reveal, to show himself further to us. Mm -hmm. so, so we can welcome new levels of relationship with Krishna. Sometimes I've heard about the saying, I've, heard, I've felt Krishna in my life present, but I don't feel Krishna present now, at this stage. And of course we know it's not that he left you. Again, he's not a cruel guy. <laughs> actually what may be happening many times is that he's getting closer to you but you are too much attached to your idea of Krishna to your experience of your relationship with Krishna being I don't know Krishna is there and I'm here so that's that's my experience of Krishna and suddenly Krishna gets closer to you and uh, comes here but you keep looking there to the usual place where you used to find Krishna and say Oh, he disappeared. He's no longer. And he's like, I'm closer than ever. Mm -hmm. But we are too attached to, to a certain version of him. So it's not that he disappeared. He got closer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, follow, you follow my point? Yeah. So we have to be open to, to rediscover his proximity in our lives. Mm -hmm. Because he's, if we are sincere and willing, he's just trying to get closer and closer to us. Of course, his, his style of getting closer maybe outside of what we imagine and because we still have our right preconceived ideas how krishna should get closer to me <laughs> but that's his prerogative he knows how to do that we cannot just krishna please come closer to me but in this 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 form okay it's like i'll do it my own way krishna will say no we you we cannot put that to the rule no? because if not we will end up even like praying to krishna krishna please give me mercy but many times we have already our preconceived idea 
of how his mercy should look like. <laughs> so we pray for mercy, but we already imagine the whole sequence and the result of that mercy coming and what will happen. So it's all still under our control. No? Give me mercy, but in this way, <laughs> which is not mercy, basically. It's just my own idea of mercy. And then Krishna gives real mercy, which is something happening outside of our control. And, but we cannot recognize that as mercy because it's outside of our idea of what mercy was. So Krishna, give me mercy. He sends mercy. And we suddenly start to pray to Krishna. Krishna, please give me mercy because this situation has come. And he said, that was my mercy. Mm -hmm. no? That was my reply to your previous prayer. So now you are praying to me to counteract the result of your previous prayer. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Krishna's like, you are strange. <laughs> right? So we, we have to yeah, align ourselves. If, if we pray for mercy, we have to open. You do it as, as, as you consider better. And I'm open to accept that. That's another way of saying what we are telling today. Be careful of our idea about Krishna, our idea about Krishna's mercy, our idea about how my relationship with God should develop. Let's, let's be always keeping a door open for, for his input as well. We may have our input, but it's a two-way street. No? We are having a conversation with God. So <laughs> he also has a voice in that. We also have a voice. He also has a voice. We are two individuals with our own free will relating with each other. So there's a place for interaction. It's not only as I think, as I like. That would be a, a dictatorship or something like that, right? So... <laughs> So anyhow, a few thoughts in connection to, to the idea. It's almost five, so I know that some of you may have some duties and waiting for you. But also, I don't know if we have a few minutes if someone has any questions, although some may have to leave, but also I like to always leave room for, for questions in Spanish. <laughs> I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, just drop away from that. Like sometimes I think we just give all the burden to guru or to Vaishnavas who can work it out for us. We have our idea of Krishna this way, but it's pretty foggy. So the guru will reveal it to him. Mm -hmm. have this I suppose one or six steps, traditional or not, but it seems to be that emphasis here. The guru will do it for us. He can do it for us. He can open our eyes to the thought like not all that. What's, what's your take on that? Okay, that's a good point, yeah. That's another class in it unto itself, <laughs> as usual, but yeah. a few words we can share. Of course, we, we don't deny these ideas of Magyana Timiranda Sagina, Anjana, Shalakaya, no, the world eyes are open with the salve of knowledge but my thoughts on that as you may imagine are not also that the guru does all the magic so to say <laughs> and we are just like passive consumers of of the guru's grace no like just guru dev give me reveal everything show me i'm just keep i'm I just keep waiting and you show me everything or you just tell me what to do and i do the guru also wants to see some initiative on our side no i mean he wants a a relationship. No, he was ideally, ideally, the guru should be concerned with with the disciples' individuality also, no? That the disciples start like we say in the morning, Prabhupada would say, I want my disciples to be in the independently thoughtful people. I just don't want to tell them what to think. No? I want to teach them how to think. That's not the same. How to think and you think for yourself, not what to think. In the beginning, of course, what to think. This is like this, like, but eventually how to think and you fly with your own wings. So in the same way, yeah, the guru gives knowledge, also you have to do something with that knowledge. Huh? It, it's the duty of the disciple to, to process that knowledge properly because the guru can be given a lecture with, two, with 100 people, but it's not that everyone is understanding the same thing or properly. So it, we have a duty to, what do I do with that? Or even Gurudev, give me mercy. Mercy comes. What will you do with the mercy now? You have to do something. Not keep asking for more mercy. 
Because sometimes we may, we may become just like, mercy, give me mercy, give me mercy. And, and the wind will blow back like, so much mercy you requested, so much mercy was conferred. What have you done with that? <laughs> so we have to, to integrate the knowledge, for example. The Guru says something. Uh, of, and of course, sometimes, as we say in the morning, the Guru may sometimes may, be, may give a very clear answer of something, very conclusive. Some other moments, the Guru may reply with another answer, another question, and throw you into outside of your comfort zone <laughs> and invite you to think from a different place and tell you, go there for a few months and think about that. Like, ruminate. And you have your duty as a disciple at that moment. You, know? you have to think for yourself. Oh, the Guru will test the disciple. Right? Like, you've seen the Bhagavatam many times. You know? Like, when Sukadev goes to Amparikshit Maharaj, it's many times. You know? Pariksit Maharaj asks Sukadev Goswami, can you talk to me about Krishna Lila? And Sukadev Goswami at the end of the ninth canto, because at that point, Pariksit Maharaj had lived four days, so he only had three more, and his main is interest is hearing Krishna Lila, but Sukadev Goswami has not narrated Krishna Lila so far. So he's kind of looking at the cloud. Can you talk about Krishna Lila? And Sukadev Goswami, at the end of the ninth canto, gives two verses summarizing Krishna Lila, testing his disciple. Like, there you have Krishna Lila. And Pariksha is like, tell me more, please. <laughs> two verses. And then we have the 10th canto. But if Pariksha will say, oh, thank you so much, that's it. Bhagavatam stops there. We don't have the 10th the canto. So the Guru is testing also the disciples. Sometimes Pariksha, at the, the end of the 5th canto, description of the hellish planets, and Pariksha march full of compassion, asking Sukadev, how one can be saved from that? And Pariksha, and Sukadev goes on to say, by karma. He's giving the wrong answer on purpose. And Pariksha say, no, it's not possible. <laughs> okay, but Gyan. No, 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 it's not possible. To, no? And he explains why. Okay, but Bhakti. Okay. No? So again, the, the Guru sometimes will not necessarily immediately show everything clearly, but hint at things and see, test the disciples, see how the whole thing develops. So, yeah, I think we as disciples should be uh, not lazy. <laughs> Because sometimes in the name of glorifying the Guru, we can over-glorify the Guru to not do our part. No? Oh Guru, you are so merciful, so incredible, that I do not even need to chant Japa because your mercy is such that you are giving me all perfection without me need needing to do anything. And that's evasiveness. That's not glorification. No? So <laughs> the Guru has a role, of course. <laughs> But the disciple has a role. It's a teamwork. The two have to do their thing. When you go to all the main verses in Shastra that describe the, the qualities of the Guru, anyhow, all of them, interestingly, first, those verses describe the qualities of the disciple. Then go to the qualities of the Guru. Like implying, it's not enough if you have a Guru. A super qualified guru. If you are not a disciple yourself, it doesn't make too much difference. <laughs> you can have the topmost Uttam Mahabhagavat Paramahamsa Nitya Siddha Acharya of the planet Earth. <laughs> if you are not there as a disciple yourself, you may not be able to take advantage from that. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking, where is my guru, where is my guru, you should ask, where I am as a disciple. I'm in the proper place because as we say today, the guru may be here. But you are not there as a disciple. I'm not seeing Guru, I'm not seeing Guru. <laughs> so, so, yeah, of course, eventually Sri Guru will show Krishna, Sri Guru will show everything clearly, provided <laughs> we as disciples do our part. No? And gradually that will attract that mercy to, re to, will attract Krishna to reveal himself through the Guru and, 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 and reach us in that particular way. Yeah. That will be my take. <laughs> Thank you for the question. <clears throat> okay. Duty calls. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Something else? Yeah. 
just looking at a little more over it, it seems that it's very um, that, that, that um, sorry, I'm getting a bit uneasy. Um, that 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 tendency to to uh, put Krishna in a box in a particular way in terms of um, to not accepting us unconditionally. <coughs> think I'm not a great, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, a, I'm not a devotee actually, because mm -hmm. I can't uphold this standard or that standard or so many things. And then, and further on, we might say, and it's you know, all these references in the in the fifth canto, they seem to, you know, tend to convey a certain type of <laughs> message about you know obedience and and you know stringent adherence to the process and so many things, you know, the psychology mm. and you can kind of, and you see very much with fundamentalist style of religions, they really do try and latch on to those in the box definitions of what God, mm -hmm. who God is as the all powerful and you know where you all end up if you, you don't totally comply with mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. expectations Where's the where's that psychology rooted? Is it an atheistic psychology that we're trying to like, you know, what does that afford us to put Krishna in that box? Is it we are control end up being the controller somehow, or what is it that we're actually? Hmm. It's not being humble. It's it's something <laughs> else. But it seems like we're just self you know self denigrating ourselves by saying I'm not a devotee, and we may feel like that, but. Mm. There must be a psychology that under underscores it all. I'm just wondering what that, mm. in your opinion, is. Of course, there are diff each case is different, so I wouldn't say there's only one answer to your question, because every person is different, and there may be different ways, reasons why people subscribe to these toxic templates. Mm -hmm. But sometimes one of them... And many of them happen unconsciously, but one of them is just by by me entering into that space where I self denigrate myself to ex to the extreme uh, unconsciously again, I don't have to take any responsibility mm. because i'm I'm useless I'm worthless and I'm not saying that to condemn that person no? that's why you are doing that because you don't want to take responsibility. <laughs> But, but that can happen sometimes. We, we, we escape responsibility by, by in, in insisting how unqualified we are. <laughs> well, when actually we are, we are capable of more, but somehow we, we resist upgrade, so to say. Because again, we may be fearful of, of the new thing, whatever comes as a new thing. As I say before in the morning, we may be afraid of, of what we don't know. We are afraid of the unknown. So even if I tell you, you have a beautiful potential, spiritually speaking, you have a beautiful potential, all of us. But that beautiful potential is unknown for many of us. And just because it is unknown, we may be terrified about it. Because we don't know what's that. We are afraid of what we don't know. <laughs> even if it's beautiful. <laughs> But we don't know what's that, so we, we get afraid. And we kind of develop some escape mechanisms, sometimes maybe entering to that place where I identify myself as incapable. And of course, in many cases, it's because unfortunately some people may have received that narrative from childhood even. No? And they, they, were, they got convinced that they were worthless. Mm -hmm. So they are like, yeah, I'm worthless. And I have no value. And, 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 and somehow... The unresolved trauma just brings them to repeat, to go to places where the same thing is kind of reconfirmed, so to say, in one way or another. No? It's like an addiction. No? It's like unhealthy, it's killing you, <laughs> but you cannot stop doing that. Mm -hmm. no? So, and I, and I think that's very important. That's why I repeat, I insist on this point of Krishna already loves you, because if you don't have that clear, I mean, that Krishna loves you means that you are lovable. Lovable? Lovable? So if Krishna loves you means you are lovable. 
on that foundation you can dare to love others because if you are really convinced that you are not lovable <laughs> probably you you won't be courageous enough to try to love anyone <laughs> you follow my point if you think i'm not lovable nobody loves me probably when when the possibility of of, of love comes you're terrified or you feel i'm worthless i'm not up for that but if you start with the foundation krishna already loves you therefore there is something if you in you that is worthy of god's love again it's not my own merit something i deserve but we are made let's put it like that on something of something ontologically that god loves i i have to i i i I even have to learn to love that thing in me that God loves. <laughs> this is the famous quote by St. John of the Cross in Christianity. He said, love what God sees in you. Mm. That's intense. That's challenging. That's not so easy. And that's not like a superficial self-love. Like, I love me and I'm so incredible and unique. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying there is something in you that Krishna loves and you have to learn to love that thing. Because if you want to love Krishna, what's the symptom of love? Love means if I love you, I also love the things you love. Whatever you love, I love that also, apart from you. So if I love Krishna, okay, I will love whatever Krishna loves. Oh, he loves me. I have to learn to love me because that's something that Krishna loves. Not to love me separate from Krishna. Mm. To love me in the context of Krishna loving me. That's humbling. That's not self-centeredness or narcissism. Do you follow my point? I, I have to develop that type of self-love. Now, there is something in me that Krishna loves. I want to love Krishna. I want to love everything that Krishna loves. So I have to learn to love that. <laughs> so, so, so I think that's a very important point to free us from these mechanisms of self-hatred or lack of self-confidence of i'm not lovable and create a new paradigm so to say yeah yes i think i am like that if i find out something that krishna loves well we may not want know what krishna loves in us so therefore it's hard for us to know what we're referring to to love but when we say well, krishna loves me we don't really know who me is so we're sort of in this vague zone of you know, he loves something about me, but I don't know what it is, so I don't know what to love. So then we're sort of in this never... <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say he loves something about you. He loves you, mm. no? Mm -hmm. Who you are. Of course, we may not yet have full realization of who, what the Atma is, mm. but I think even on a theoretical level, it's a very, how to say, healthy beginning point. Like, okay, you don't have a clue who you are, but whatever you are, Krishna loves that. <laughs> no. Start with that, and in time you you will get to know who you are, and therefore you get you will get to know what Krishna loves no? in you, which is you. It's not that Krishna loves in you something and something else in you he hates. No, regard what you are as an atma, because everything else is not you. What you are, Krishna loves that. So I think that will give. How to say enough impetus to try to discover that? <laughs> no, that's something that Krishna loves. What's that? Let's discover that. <laughs> Not just as a, as a private, separate project. I will discover my soul. I will discover what Krishna loves, which happens to be me. <laughs> so I look. I'm discovering me, but not separate from Krishna's love. So, so that's the ideal combination, so to say. Yeah. Something else before concluding? Okay. I think we can conclude here and maybe we can do some if you want some kirtan. Yeah. You have some minutes. You're invited yeah, to join us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sri Sachinandan Gor Hari ki Jai Sri Sri Gor Nitai ki Jai Sri Hari Nam Sankirtan ki Jai Sadhu Sangha ki Jai Gor Pramanan Hari Bo Panchakal Pataru Vishra Kripa Sindhu Fiya Eva Cha Tita Nam Pava Nemiyo Vaishnavibhya Anantakoti Vaishnavrindaki Jai Gor Pramanan Hari Bo